and we'll start the webinar now. Give your folks just a moment to join us. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight, and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Min Jin Lee and Jennifer Bueller to celebrate the publication of Penguin Classics Deluxe Trade Paperback Edition of The Great Gatsby. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks tonight to Min, Jennifer, and the team at Penguin Classics for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen if you're interested. There are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we do highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for audio and video versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured special edition of The Great Gatsby is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase The Great Gatsby and many other great books on site, or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop the buy link in the chat in a moment. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Okay, on to introductions. Our speakers tonight are Jennifer Bueller and Min Jin Lee. Jennifer Bueller is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Programs in Educational Studies at the School of Education at St. Louis University. She's the author of Teaching Reading with YA Literature, Complex Text, Complex Lives, and the former host of Text Messages, a monthly young adult literature podcast sponsored by ReadWriteThink.org. Jennifer received her PhD from the University of Michigan after spending 10 years as a high school English teacher, and she received the NCTE Promising Researcher Award for her ethnographic work on urban school culture. She's the author of the Suggestions for Further Exploration, featured in the premium mass market edition of The Great Gatsby from Penguin Classics. Min Jin Lee is the author of the best-selling novels Free Food for Millionaires and Pachinko, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and one of the New York Times Book Review's top 10 books of, of 2017. She's a writer in residence at Amherst College and the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard, and she lives here in New York. She is the author of the introduction of this new Penguin Classics edition of The Great Gatsby. So Min and Jennifer are gonna be talking about F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby tonight. A brilliant evocation of the Roaring Twenties and a satire of post-war America obsessed with wealth and status, The Great Gatsby is a novel whose power remains undiminished after a century. It's also particularly special to us at Greenlight Bookstore. It's one of the sources of the bookstore's name and is our only permanent staff pick. So we're really looking forward to this conversation tonight about the book's legacy and about this new edition, which restores Fitzgerald's masterpiece to the original American classic he envisioned based on scholarship dating back to the novel's first publication in 1925 and featuring Min Jin Lee's introduction addressing how gender, race, class, and sexuality complicate the pursuit of the American dream. So Min and Jennifer will be talking together and then we'll open it up to your questions after that. Please take it away, Min and Jennifer. Thank you so much for the intro, Jessica. Min, I'm so happy to be here talking to you. Hey, Jennifer. Hey. So, <laughs> How are you, girl? <laughs> I'm great. We did not know each other when we both signed on to this project, but I want to acknowledge up front that we are both Yaleys and we do our homework. And part of my homework for taking on the project was first to learn about you, which oh involved God. reading Pachinko and Free Food for Millionaires and looking for kind of points of intersection between the two of us. Um, so that leads me to feel like tonight is a real privilege because um, getting to know you has been a perk of the project. So when we were planning, we thought that we would talk about um, first 
how you approach the project of writing this intro. Um, second, a little bit about this book as it lives in the world of schools as well as literary and popular culture. So like thinking about what it means to read the book as part of a classroom setting versus reading it on your own. And then I'd like to talk thirdly just about literature as a prism for reading the world and oneself as a participant in that world. So that's the arc that I'm imagining. Um, I wanna first just say that when I got to read your intro, um, it wasn't in this copy of the book, it was in the page proofs that landed in my email in August. I loved the intro so much, Min, and I loved that I was reading it, having a little sense of you at that point. I wrote you this long letter from the back seat of my car. We were taking my kid to college. I was moved personally by the intro because you wrote it personally. Your voice is woven through it very um, authentically and genuinely. So I wanna start with the grand tour question of how did you think about the project of that intro? How did you decide how to go about writing it? But actually prior to that, I wanna ask why did you say yes to this project? When Penguin Classics came calling why did you accept the invitation and, and not decline it? Well, first of all, thank you to Jessica for the introduction and for having us. And thank you, Jennifer, for your kindness and generosity and genius. They asked me who I wanted to talk to. And I said, I want to talk to you because I have read your letters. And I also I know that you know everything about this book far more than I do. And I figured, you know, I'm just going to lean on you heavily when I have <laughs> deficits. But to answer your question, and you're such a good letter writer too. That's one of the things I wanted to say. I, I, I was kind of overwhelmed by the, the bigness of your mind. It's very cool. So I think that I approached this project or I, I accepted it because I've turned down some other invitations that I've gone to write introductions because I think, the, I think that Gatsby is so permeated through our culture, not just America, but around the world. And because I've lived overseas and I've had to travel so much um, pr promoting books and to give lectures, I know what Gatsby means to people around the world. And I thought, well, what is it that I really want to say about the great Gatsby? And I had so much to say. And then I thought, well, how do I even approach that? Um, the frame that I approached initially was, I'm working on my third novel and Fitzgerald is working, was working on a third novel. And that seems completely insane to sort of like talk about it that way. But that was really important for me because in a way, when I was in college and you and I know what that means to be in New Haven and um, the, 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 the space that Fitzgerald puts Nick Kerouac in, the Car Carraway in, as well as uh, puts Tom. Um, Tom Buchanan, mm -hmm. and, because they're both Yaleys. And yep. when I think of Yaleys, I don't think of me. I actually think of people like that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to figure out, well, what was so important about me going to a place like that? And I thought it's because that's when I really, that's when I realized that writers are regular people. Mm -hmm. So even F. Scott Fitzgerald, the author of The Great Gatsby, and what that means around the world, a hundred years after it's a uh, publication virtually, we think of thinking of, we, we think that he's just a regular guy. And that was really important. I think sometimes we forget that writers are just regular people. And for the most part, they're kind of really messy, sloppy people. And I think that's a good thing to know. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about um, believing in the book and valuing the book enough to say yes to the project. You talked about it in global terms and personal terms. So like the resonance of Gatsby around the world and then just the resonance of Gatsby as you can see your own connections to Fitzgerald. I loved how the very first line of your intro is um, about being a late bloomer. I'm a late bloomer, so I can't help but admire the blue flame of prodigy. So when I think about how, um, how I unpacked what you did in that intro, you talked about your sense of connectedness to Fitzgerald, despite for both of us, the differences in gender and class privilege, and in your case, race and ethnicity from Fitzgerald, yet still that connection was there. And then you talked about kind of taking the book apart by looking at it through the lens of queerness, gender, the role of women and social class. So, Say more about first 
putting yourself in there as a fellow late bloomer with Fitzgerald and then how you move from that to think about like the literary readings of the book that you did like what was it what was the risk involved in like putting your personal voice and kind of your personal story as a novelist in there in the intro well I think that oh gosh it's so hard to approach something like The Great Gatsby as a writer Right. It is. And I think most people will be really intimidated by it. So for me, I had to keep reminding myself of who he is as a person. And the more research that I did, I realized not only was he an ordinary person, in some ways, he was vain. He was, he had that sort of arrogance that prodigies do. And at the same time, I really admire genius and prodigy. So I have to say that I do sit at the altar of people who are brilliant. And, I, and, and I'm actually very good at being a fan. Like when I meet a person who's really smart, I don't feel resentful. I just feel like, wow, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> and I, I really, I, I like that sort of adoring stance. I am more inclined to like somebody who's smarter than me than not. So in that sense, I approach it that way. At the same time, because I'm also a creator, I have to have the arrogance myself to say, I belong in a group in which I, am allowed to have a point of view. But, and I think that for me, I have admired and I have learned about writing by reading great writers. I've always approached all of my kind of um, autodidacticism, very hard to say. <laughs> uh, all of my self-teaching has been done by looking at the books that I most admire. There is a tendency to think that because a book doesn't include a person like you, that somehow it doesn't reflect you. And I think for me, when I teach the greats in my syllabus, like whether I teach George Orwell or Virginia Woolf or James Baldwin, and if, the, and if my student does not reflect the biographical aspect of that author, I say, let's talk about race. Let's talk about class. Let's talk about gender. Let's talk about queerness. And that's my way of including my student. So I approach this book as a student and as a reader and as a teacher and also as an enthusiast for somebody who really wants to know more. Would I say that The Great Gatsby is my favorite book? Absolutely not. It is not my favorite book. But is it a book that I turn to again and again and also admire enormously? Yes. Do I think that it deserves its place in the pantheon of American literature? Absolutely. So I think that I kind of approached it in those ways and wherever I tried and I, and I was really thinking about kids who are poor, kids who are in high school, kids who are in college, who are reading this book for the first time. And how would that young person look at this book and go like, is this just about some white people from the Midwest to go to New York? <laughs> and I thought that would be sad if you only saw it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And all those things resonate with me. This is not my favorite book, but it is so important to me to think about the lasting power that some books have. And this is one um, who has that lasting power. Um, you said um, that you come to it as a reader, a teacher, an enthusiast. And you said something in your introduction that you've loved the book for a long time, so not a favorite, but you can still feel love for it and that your understanding has grown more layered and provocative. So I'm quoting you in the beginning part of your intro. So I'm juxtaposing that with what you just said that you're thinking about potentially kids in high school classrooms who are gonna pick up this edition and it's their first time. But when you think about your layered experiences with the book over years, how has your reading become more provocative of the book? What did you mean by that? I think it becomes more provocative because I'm not scared of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh -huh. Like if I met the guy at a party, I wouldn't think, oh, he's better than me. Does that make sense? And I say that, I, I say that very specifically because F. Scott Fitzgerald often wor worried about things like that, worried about being the inferior person at a party. So I think that he would even understand my statement. Um, when I was a young person and I looked at a book like The Great Gatsby and it was told to me by librarians that this was an important American book, of course, I approached it with a kind of awe and wonder. I'm 52 years old. I mean, this, young, this man died at 44. So at this point, at my age, 
I'm actually older than when he was when he died. And certainly he wrote this book in his 20s. And he was a young married person in his 20s who kind of was trying to understand, well, what do I do with the fact that I'm working on my third book? And my second book didn't measure up to my first. So what will my third be like? And I want, and he says, I want to be extravagantly admired again. So I think that because I'm not afraid, because I'm not overawed, because at this point in my life, I've met some of the greatest writers in America. I'm thinking, well, you know, he was a good writer and he had a lot of important things to say. And just because you write a really good book doesn't mean that you always write very good books every single time. <laughs> so in that sense, I can become more provocative and I, can, and I can be more challenging. And also I care less what people think what I say anymore as I get older. I'm, I'm willing to say, you know, why don't we talk about the queerness of this book? Why don't we talk about the race aspects of this book? And why don't we talk about money? Because I think Fitzgerald was really interested in money. I mean, every one of his correspondences almost seems to talk about money. And I thought, let's talk about money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're both older than him. It's pretty sobering when you put it that way. You're 52, I'm 50. And he's we're twice as old as he was when he wrote that book. That's right. So I'm more inclined to be intimidated than you, I think. But it's really helpful to just think about that positionality, um, you know, in the world. So um, you were talking about kind of creating spaces for kids to come at this book through the mm -hmm. way you approach the intro. So let me think about two things at once here. You also told us in the intro that you still have your own first copy of Gatsby. Dang it, I do too. And it's way over there on the top of my bookshelf. But <laughs> we both have, our, I mean, mine's the little mass market edition that I read in high school. And you said you your copy says in, inside the front cover, second time, um, 84, 85, it was a book that you were reading for the second time between your junior and senior year of high school. So let me touch on that little piece of biography first before we skip back to what you did in the intro. What do you remember about the first time you read it? Oh, I remember thinking it was really fun to read. It was so soapy and propulsive and I only read it for plot. And I wasn't thinking about all the minor characters. I was reading it just kind of like, oh, will he get the girl, right? Boy loses girl, tries to get the girl, tries to get a lot of uh, money in order to get the girl, throws a lot of parties, tries to invite the girl. <laughs> you know, that's what you're sort of thinking about the age of 13 when you're reading it because, and of course, in a way, when you're that young, you're thinking, am I the girl? Am I the boy? What am I, where, where do I fit in? And then of course, every single time you read it again, and also at a different point in your life, like I do not identify with Gatsby anymore or Daisy or any of those people. As a matter of fact, I think of it much more like I, I, I'm thinking, let's talk about capitalism. <laughs> you know, that, that's where I am. And, and I think the more I studied F. Scott Fitzgerald, the more I realized, no, that's what he was interested in too. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when you read it, like other um, like markers in time of when you picked the book up? Like, did you only read it in school slow down. Did you read it in school? No, no, it was the summer. Why did you pick it up between your junior and senior year? Oh, well, you know, I came to America when I was seven without having any knowledge of English. So I've always been trying to learn how to read and write and speak by reading. No one ever told me to read it in a book by a teacher. It wasn't a teacher who told me to read it. It was just, I thought I would read everything that was great. Like that was my insane thing. Like I thought- I did it okay. too. Right, like yeah. I was like, I'm going to read every great book. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna start now. <laughs> and then and then I just kind of went for it and then I realized it wasn't even a goal anymore. It was something that I just loved. So I would rather read more than anything. And even now as a writer, I really see myself as a reader. I think of myself as a world-class reader. <laughs> Like, I don't think of myself as a world-class anything, but as a reader, I'm like, I'm really good. <laughs> you can put me up there with anybody. And it's, and I think that's the joy that I felt with Fitzgerald. But going back to your question, how many times did I read it? Gosh, I read it at least half a dozen times. Mm -hmm. And at such different spaces in time. Like, how, when did you read it 
as an adult? Like, were you in your 20s or 30s or 40s? So um, I read it in high school, junior year American Lit, and then I don't think I picked it up again until I was teaching high school in Michigan, and it was one of the American Literature core course books. So I have a second copy of the book that was from that time period. So that would have been when I was in my mid to late 20s as a young English teacher. Um, and then I don't, it's not a book, unlike you, I didn't pick the book up ritually over time um, as it was informing like my projects or my life, you know, my life's work. Um, then I read it again this summer as an audio book, the audio edition by Tim Robbins in order to reacquaint myself right. with it for this project. So, I mean, I had that period of reading it and rereading it a bunch as a teacher, but really there's just like three points on my timeline arc. And it sounds like you've got more and it sounds like you always read it in a non-institutional space. Is that right? Yes, always in a non-institutional yeah. space because I don't have the training in English and literature. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that you can see my anxiety because I take my scholarship so seriously because I don't have the formal training. Mm -hmm. I was not an English major. I went to law school. I don't have an MFA in literature or in fine arts for creative writing. So when I was writing the introduction, I did something really strange. I was given the option of writing as much as I wanted to write. So then I did, I ended up writing a 6,000 word essay. I think most novelists who write introductions tend to write something between 1500 to 2,500 words. And I just went for broke and I put in like a hundred footnotes and I just couldn't stop because the deeper I went that I felt like the more I had to say, and I wonder what you think about this, Jennifer, because you, when you were teaching English for the first time, were you thinking, oh, these are my students and these students are different than this other group of students. So when I speak to college students, let's say who are MFA students at U Michigan versus let's say when I'm giving a lecture at Harvard, I, I think differently. Or if I think of a private school that's high school versus a public school, I think about my audience and how different they are. And I thought, how can I talk in a way that this book is sexy and exciting and interesting and important to mm -hmm. that audience? And then I thought, I'm just going to put it all in there. And then something in each of those four sections will appeal to that group. That's great. You asked if I think that way about my students. Now I do. But when I was in my mid 20s, still getting my sea legs under me as a teacher, I think I taught that book out of um, a sense of duty to the curriculum and a sense of um, People say this is the American dream novel, so I need to sort of filter it through that lens, which is a overly simplistic way to go. And that's why I thought your intro was so great, because you open up lots of different pathways for thinking about the story and the legacy of the story. And literary theory is a way to do that. I mean, you don't couch it in sort of high literary theory mode. I didn't major in English at Yale because I was intimidated by all that literary theory stuff. But now I get it, how if you think about queerness as a lens, you can see things in that book that you wouldn't otherwise see. And if you think about you know, social class, you can sort of hone in on certain, if you think about race, you can hone in on certain things. So um, I appreciate that you've sort of mapped out those different ways to travel in the story. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I was just curious in terms of, I know that it's controversial to do biographical criticism. And I did that too. And I know that people are going to have different ideas, like, you know, should it matter? And then I thought, you know what, I'm a writer. <laughs> I can say if I'm having a bad day, it does affect my pages. If I'm worried about, let's say money, it does affect my pages. If I was having an affair, it would affect the way I understand love. So I said, I'm going to put it in there and there are going to be people who don't like it, but I want you to know that is what was going on. And in that sense, I did feel a sense of the, the provocativeness mm -hmm. of my challenge of writing that introduction is to share the fact that these things were going on in his life. Do I know for sure that um, Fitzgerald locked up his wife in her and in, in their home when he she demanded a divorce i wasn't there as an eyewitness so as a as a trained historian i think oh no that you can't do that <laughs> but at the same time there were enough 
accounts that were written in which I could I could cite and say that's what they said. The problem with Zelda and Scott are that they did drink a lot and they told a lot of stories. So the reportage that you have, all the primary documents around that time conflict. And that's really interesting. So there were certain situations like her suicide attempt. I would say there are varying accounts about the divorce. There are varying accounts about alcoholism. And I think that was because I did feel sensitive as somebody who trained in history and somebody who went to law school. Like, I can't say it's not like two plus two equals four but this is what biographers have presented. And I wanted to create, um, I wanted to really respect all the different work that biographers have done. And there are different camps, like there is the Zelda camp, there is a Scott camp, and they have very strong opinions. And they have done the kind of research that I haven't done. They, they've spent the kind of years that I haven't spent and I wanted to honor both. So they are included in the notes. Yeah, no, I should have emphasized the biography lens as a yet another one. I'm so glad you did that because it's another point of connection as we said at the beginning, you were saying I'm a late bloomer and so was Scott Fitzgerald in terms of this being book number three for him um, and writers being people. When you were doing your research for this project, I know I read Maureen Corrigan's book, So We Play On, I think. I think so, yeah. Anyway, and you mentioned that too. Um, what other approaches did you take to the research? Well, I do a weird thing where I've noticed that if I read, let's say the letters of Van Gogh, <laughs> I'll notice that he'll talk about Balzac's Paragorio. And if I read Paragorio, it'll mention other books. So, and I think that for me, it's always been that kind of, writers will point to other writers. So when I got, I ended up spending, I don't know, eight or $900 on books about Fitzgerald. Why? Because I'm crazy. <laughs> and, um, and also I didn't want to be wrong. And I wanted to be right about what I said. And then there's another part of me that really thought as a, as a teacher and also as a parent, if you see my footnotes, you could find them. And you could look at them. And I want you to realize that when you assert something, it needs to be verified. And I think this comes a little bit from the fact that I'm a trustee at PEN America, where lately in the 20th, 21st century, I'm sort of obsessed with research and verification. Mm -hmm. This assertion and the, and the level of um, integrity and the way we do our work and the way we think about ideas, I really want my students to understand that like, I actually don't assign any research papers because I teach fiction and nonfiction writing personal essays. But even as you're writing a personal essay, I really want people to really think clearly and deeply about the responsibility of what we assert. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love hearing that bit about you spending eight or nine hundred dollars on <laughs> books about Gatsby and Fitzgerald. And thank you in the chat. And I've included Maureen's book in the um, this little edition has suggestions for further exploration. It is so we read on how the great Gatsby came thank to be you. wide indoors. I read that one as an audio book this summer as well, along with Pachinko, because um, I just wanted to do my homework. Maureen reads her own audio book. So it was for me a great primer in the biographical history, the literary history and like close reading of the text. She treats Gatsby as a crime novel, by the way, right, like in, right. in, in detective noir. Um, and you left all those footnotes. So in these editions, there's a suggested reading list that comes out of your research, as well as the suggestions that I've given at the back of the book. Um, okay, so all that research you did, I'm trying to think of where to go next. When you talked about teaching, you've never taught this book straight up, right? You've no, never had no. it as a text in one of your classes, but you've talked about being a teacher and thinking about students and who's in front of you. So in the time we've got left, I wanna talk about the two other kind of dimensions of our plan for tonight, which is the teaching dimension and then sort of how this book sheds light or can serve as a prism for our world and like now. Um, what are your thoughts about people who will be thinking about how to approach this book as a teacher of it given these new additions now, new introductions, um, and kind of the reminder that there are lots of different ways to frame the text. Like, what would you most want to see in classrooms today, people who are picking up this book, given the work that you've done on it, 
and like the personal connectedness that you see as possible for people in it, people who aren't just in that white privilege set. I would love it if people, if students can have permission to talk about race, to talk about sexuality. And I think that that would be really important for kids who are feeling really excluded. I have felt excluded in so many spaces. And I think, for example, like to talk about queerness, there is, you know, there are two, two lines in Gatsby, which could suggest that Nick is actually queer. There are. I mean, he is dating women. At the same time, there is a scene in which he is with a, a total stranger and the other stranger has disrobed and is in his underwear. It's very possible that they could have had a sexual encounter. And I think we don't want to talk about that. And I don't know why. Why isn't that discussed? And I think that can be discussed in high school classrooms. When I think about what children who are thinking about their sexuality are going through in terms of their isolation. So much of it is about, about the fact that we have taboos and things we can't talk about. So why couldn't we talk about that in Gatsby? Why can't that be explored? If you are having a hookup or a sexual encounter with a total stranger, that needs to be addressed. I mean, Fitzgerald was not being a prude. I don't know why we need to be prudes about it. Mm -hmm. Also, why can't we talk about the fact that this is the way white women are treated mm -hmm. and how white women are seen by a white man at that point? Um, in the 1920s, there were non-white people in America. There are quite a lot of non-white people in America. So when we think about this book as being a definitive period about the Roaring Twenties, no, we're actually saying it's just about a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. And when you give students permission to say it without any sort of judgment or cruelty or no, we can't talk about it. Oh, we're not going to talk about race again. And I think that's really a mistake and it makes students feel really disconnected. So many students in public schools are not coming from Minnesota. So if they're not, then can't we talk about, can't we include them since we have uh, these bigger themes that need to be addressed? Mm -hmm. I think, um pathways in talking about social class are a little bit easier. Let's talk about the race part too. Like mm -hmm. you were thinking, if I were teaching this book, I would want to make it clear that this book isn't only just for white kids. And this book is not just about a bunch of rich white people. Like that's the characters in the foreground, but there's like subtext and background here too. What are your thoughts on like the kind of conversation that we can open up around those layers, race well, layers, identities beyond like just sort of traditional privileged white people. Oh, you know, for example, the anti-Semitism about Meyer Wolfsheim. Mm -hmm. like, I want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So in my syllabus, I, I present some of the greatest writings in, in short segments to my students for fiction and nonfiction. So when I teach my students about essay, I, I basically say, if you don't know Vir Virginia Woolf, Annie Dillard, uh, Tom Woolf, George Orwell, in addition to you know uh, Richard Rodriguez and James Baldwin, then I don't think you really have considered the Western or especially the American essay, especially the Western essay. That said, if you read some of their work, they say some really dumb racist things. They have. And I'll say, well, this part is fantastic. And this part is really goofy. And then I say something like, you know, if you want to use race as texture, if ethnic people or outsiders are the way um, you want to seem cool, cut it out. Like be more imaginative. But do I really believe that you should throw George Orwell out or Virginia Woolf out? That would be such a shame. That would be such a shame. But I do address it and I don't um, poo poo anybody who dis dislikes them. Like, so if you hated F. Scott Fitzgerald for whatever reason, like, I still want you to know that he wrote this book that's incredibly important and for these reasons. And you're gonna have to fight now to stay in the syllabus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like all the dead guys are gonna have to fight. <laughs> all the dead women and dead guys are gonna have to fight. And I wanna know why I should keep you. And if you are really good at structure, like Gatsby is mm -hmm. so beautiful on structure, yeah then I think you get to stay. If you're gonna talk about how the rich essentially obliterate the poor, mm -hmm. and I think it's a value that we need to discuss, you're gonna to get to stay. Do I think the way he treated Meyer Wolfsheim is fair? No, I don't. 
Mm-hmm. I don't like anti-Semitism in any form. And I and I, I'll say it. And in my classes, you will hear me say something like, that's not um, a very smart way to think about African Americans. And you know, so I teach a Saul Bellow story in which I talk about there's like a little segment of it where I just kind of think that seems really too easy to think about Asian women as prostitutes and black women as prostitutes. Mm-hmm. That section, kind of dumb. This section, really brilliant. <laughs> but do I want to get rid of Saul Bellow? No. I really love the parallel in what I hear there between the way you think about Fitzgerald as a person and the way you think about the book he wrote. Oh, You know, you can celebrate and admire prodigy and, you know, ex- dream, exquisite talent. And you can say this is a person who really struggled in his life with a lot of inner demons, made mistakes, died young of alcoholism. And you could say this book is beautiful and brilliant, but it has some really, it has some flawed things in it. It has some racist things in it. Um, Okay, so we live in a time of heightened racial consciousness and heightened class consciousness. So let's pivot to like the last little dimension about the world we're living in now. Gatsby, you were, oh, you said in the intro, um, he tricks you into thinking about inequity, Fitzgerald does. Um, and that this story back in the day called out to you as a girl who lived in the Valley of the Ashes and now um, gives you wisdom to imagine and revise your own American dream. So let's just talk a little bit about what, what do you think this book can illuminate now in this very fractious, um, unstable time that we are in, in American culture and American history right now, rampant inequality, a lot of social struggle going on. Um, you know, it's a really fraught time in our, in our country. Well, we it's a really have, big question, but still, what could you, can Gatsby shed light? I do at, think on Gatsby. Now? I think Gatsby sheds light on it. I think writers are constantly thinking about inequity. I think folks like you and I are trying to understand with all the knowledge and reading that we've done, how can we be better people? How can we create better societies? I think that F. Scott Scott Fitzgerald was thinking deeply about a better world. And I think he was a philosopher. I think he cared a great deal about morality. He saw himself as a moralist. And this is a moral story. And I think this is the reason why so many English teachers like teaching this book. What I find interesting is that most people conflate Scott Fitzgerald's personal life and um, his message. He lived as, Mm -hmm. uh, as somebody who wasn't good at saving money. He made a lot of money. He spent a lot of money. He was interested in pleasure. He also had his demons. He did struggle with alcoholism and addiction and depression much of it was improperly treated. And he was also somebody who grew up as a Catholic who even thought about joining the priesthood. And he was also loyal in many ways and he tried to do his duty. So he had all these different parts of him. And I only mention it because in sharing this work, I guess, and he is somebody who survived a pandemic. (laughs) That's important too. How could I forget the pandemic? Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that thing that happened 100 years ago, we're happening it again right now. And I think to think about life and death, if we think about life and death and what that means and what books can mean, when we spend our time with pages and with another universe that a creator is sharing with you, they're really sharing a certain philosophy. And I'm, and I'm really sad that people sort of equate Gatsby with parties and film representations where you see glamour and flappers, when in fact, we should really be thinking about how three people die in this story Mm -hmm. and they die without justice. Mm -hmm. Two people from Queen, two working class people, one woman who's killed violently, Mm -hmm. and then also another man who loved um, a rich person too much, a beautiful person too much. Mm -hmm. And the tragedy part is the thing that we focus on we should focus on, I think, rather than the glamour part. What I like about F. Scott Fitzgerald is he understood that if he wanted to be a moralist, he had to be very sexy about it. Mm -hmm. And The Great Gatsby is a very sexy story, so much so that the sex appeal has almost made him lose the moral appeal of it. 
nice. You know, in the intro, you frame it as this, you could think of it as a satire. You can think of it as a tragedy. You could think about it as coming of age, Mm -hmm. like, you know, gaining a new, more complex way of seeing the world. So I just wanted to put that in there too. Um, It's a painful thing to have to reckon with knowledge that the world isn't what you thought it was, or people aren't what you thought they were. Well, isn't that what we're doing right now with American politics? I think that for me, the hardest part to look at what happened in the Capitol last week is to see, (sighs) I don't believe every single person who stormed the Capitol was crazy. I don't. They actually really believed it. So what I really take to task are people who uh, were spreading in misinformation. So the fact that people are really believing these things and, and, and it's very unverified and actually will take action and destroy their own lives by following a demagogue. To me, that's the tragedy because they loved too much. Like, are we loving the wrong people too much? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. It looks like there's six, 15 questions in the Q&A, so we'll get to those in a minute. But one last thing, Min, I want to ask. You've got your third novel in the works. Yeah. I don't know a thing about it. I don't know if the world knows about it, but I haven't been privy to that. Um, I think you've alluded to Gatsby has some relevance or resonance to your current project. Is, before we open it up to the group, anything you want to say about how this work is informing your your personal lived experience as a writer of a book right now? Because it certainly is, you said well, how it illuminates the world that we've just experienced in the past week. I think Gatsby was really important important to inform my first book, Free Food for Millionaires, a book set in Queens, in which we talk about class and money. So if you look about the division between Queens and Manhattan, it is two separate countries. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was um, something that was a legacy for me and how Scott Fitzgerald affected me in terms of my next book, which is about um, American education. So it's called American Hogwan, and it's about Koreans and how they perceive education and about elitism. I think the elite view that Fitzgerald was constantly struggling with, because he always felt like this outsider. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about assimilation. So I think that Scott Fitzgerald has affected the way I take on these topics, uh, and because I think I am a moralist too. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay, Jessica's back. Jessica, help us with the Q&A. There's 16 things in there. I haven't even looked at it yet. Oh my. Thanks, Min and Jennifer. We have a lot of really good questions. So it's my pleasure to bring them to you and hear what you've got to say about them. Um, the first one we've got is from Nicole, who writes, Hi, Min. You wrote that the publication of Gatsby wrote, broke Fitzgerald's heart. Will you expand on that? Oh, well, it broke his heart because he wanted it to be successful. And it was critically successful, but it was a huge commercial failure. And he really needed the money. Because at that point in his life, what happened was he had written the play, The Vegetable. He thought it was going to go on Broadway and become this huge success. And of course, it never went to Broadway. It got terrible reviews. And then he was left in debt. So tail between his legs, he had to go to Europe and kind of hide out while he was writing Gatsby. And then, of course, with Gatsby, um, the reception of it for him was very painful because it didn't do very well. Um, His second printing never sold out. So it didn't go out of publication, but it never sold out. And and while he was alive, there were copies still in the warehouse. No no writer ever wants to hear that. Um, okay, so this is this is a great question. It's something you touched on a little in your conversation, um, but it's from Mina. She says, uh, it's so interesting to hear your take on representation. As a high school English teacher, we are revisiting the canon of American literature and definitely rethinking the biographical representation. Mm-hmm. How would you balance this when thinking about a general survey of American literature? For example, we just added Ernesto Quinones' Bodega Dreams as part of the canon and our Latinx Hispanic students were over the moon. So maybe both of you guys could speak to that. What do you think, Jennifer? What about um, revisiting the canon and expanding yeah. the canon? Um, so my first take is there is a group of brilliant, four brilliant women in National Council of Teachers of English. Their hashtag on Twitter is called Disrupt Texts. And Trisha Ibarvia, Julia Torres, Dr. Kim Parker, and Lorena German 
they are doing really brilliant work about thinking very innovatively about how to decenter the canon or complement the canon with text that would mix it up. And kind of like in your intro, give just more ways in for students. So I don't have anything great to add in, in response to this question other than the notion that bringing in books like Bodega Dreams is exactly what the, dis, the spirit of disrupt text is all about. Um, the more books you can put next to one another, you know, in a menu or on an arc of reading experiences over time, um, the more complicated each book seems in relation to the others, you know, books in conversation with one another, just the way that readers are in conversation with books. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I really feel sorry for teachers. It, and, I, and I think about science, science, science teachers. I'm going to talk about science teachers for a second because I went to the Bronx High School of Science. <laughs> and when I think about how the biology textbook, the section on genetics, when I was taking it was very slim. And now it could dwarf the entire textbook. There's so much new science that we need to learn. And that's a good thing. And because there's a lot there, but can a young person handle it? Because you still have the same number of hours of teaching it. So I really worry about this with literature as well. There's actually more and that's wonderful. There's actually progress. And yet can a high school student who's so overloaded with her humongous backpack <laughs> handle the amount of information? And then of course we have this horrible problem with college admissions being an absolute shit show. It's just so terrible and making students do untold number of extra things in order to get into college. I. I really wish that it's possible to introduce even just little tiny bite-sized samples of something than not at all. Like I would really hate it if a student couldn't see um, certain sections of books that I think are so, like if they couldn't read two or three Shakespeare plays, that would be very sad for me. Just, just like, I mean, narratively, that would just be really tragic for me. And yet, of course I want, as many different voices as possible because I want students to get excited about books. I mean, gosh, like the screen is fine, but if you really wanna have a composed ordered mind, you really do need to turn to a book. All right, this one is a, a kind of a juicy one. Kristen, it sounds like is also a teacher as well. She asks, my students often speculate that Nick is in love with Gatsby. What's your take on this and do you agree? Yeah, I called it a bromance. <laughs> That's a word. I actually in used the word intro. bromance in my introduction. So, <laughs> and you know what? And I think it's great for the students to talk about it, right? Like, why can't we fall in love with each other, with each other even if we're the same sex? Like, I could fall in love with a woman. It may not necessarily mean that I want to have sex with her. But I think fangirling, falling in love with a person, wanting to always be around her. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you look at Victorian letters between women, there's a lot of confirmation that women are always falling in love with each other. Does that mean that they're going to get married or that they're lesbians? I don't know. But you know what? Like, why do we have to put it in such a simple box? And I think that's the reason why I love the umbrella of queerness, because it's so much more inclusive. It's so much more thoughtful about the fact that we have all these complicated feelings. Jennifer, anything to add? <laughs> no, I just love that you use the word bromance in the intro to the Penguin Classics version of Gatsby. So <laughs> dig into it, audience members, if you haven't already. Okay, um, this one's from Ahana. She says, you wrote in your intro that you never envisioned yourself as the target audience. So I guess like the person Fitzgerald was intending to write for. How does the author's intent come into play when you're reading old or older texts? I'm 99% sure that I was never the target audience <laughs> for most of the books that I love, but it doesn't mean that I can't love them. And it doesn't mean that I can't see that that bias didn't exist. Like just because someone didn't see me didn't mean that uh, I shouldn't be there in the room. I mean, I think one of the funny things about my personal life is that I'm constantly in rooms where people are kind of going like, and who let you in? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I just name it. I just want to own that awkwardness of it. It's like, yes, you're right. I know you're surprised to see me here, but here I'm here. And actually, um, I'm actually more fun than you think I'm going to be. <laughs> I mean, people still ask me questions like, did you write Pachinko in translation? People ask me if 
I, there, there, people routinely ask me routinely if I speak English or not, or uh, I get, I get a lot of really silly things. And you know what? I could be angry about it all the time. And sometimes I'm angry about it, but most of the times I think most people are kind of, I, I just find it amusing. Okay, this one, this one might be a, something to follow up on later, but um, Stella is asking, would Minjin Lee be willing to share a reading list from the class she's teaching? I'd love to know what work she's recommending to her students. I don't know if that's how, how hard or easy that would be to do. Oh, I don't know if I wanna share my entire syllabus, but let's see. Um, you know what people are probably surprised that I have? Uh, oh gosh, you know, I, I'm gonna think about this some more, but you know, the fact that I do teach Saul Bellow, People are always surprised by that, but I think he's terrific. There's a lot to learn from Saul Bellow. I teach Orwell. I, I feel really strongly about teaching Orwell's essays. I teach Baldwin a lot. I teach Richard Rodriguez. And all these people have certain controversial, they're, they're very polemical figures. I teach Virginia Woolf. So, yeah. The good news is it's recorded and people can go back and rewatch the recording and just jot down all those names and the other ones you mentioned earlier. Like Frank Conroy, somebody that I, I, I mean, pff, He's so good. He's so good as a fiction writer. Those are some awesome re uh, recommendations. Um, so the next two are both about um, comparisons between Fitzgerald book and, and your own workmen. So one is from Jean, one is from Daniel. And Jean is asking about what characters in Free Food have great similarities or differences with characters in Gatsby. And Daniel's asking about parallels between Gatsby and Daisy and your characters, Hansu and Sunja. So I wonder if you want to talk about either, either or both of those. Wow, wow. Um, you know, I think Daisy's actually not a person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Daisy is an idol. And I think that Scott Fitzgerald is really critiquing his own sense of idol worship. So for me, when Hansu loves Sanja, for example, I think Hansu doesn't even know Sanja. I think the way we love people sometimes is not because we know them, but we they represent an ideal for us. And that ideal can somehow kill us. So Daisy is absolutely, she can kill you. And she does kill people. <laughs> and she walks away with it. And one of the things that I wanted to show is that every one of my characters has a philosophical strain. And I think about that. I think, so for example, if I'm thinking about Jennifer or if I'm thinking about Jessica, I, I'm really interested in what you believe. I'm interested in your moral universe. I'm interested in your moral philosophy. And once I know that, I can pretty much predict what decisions that you'll make. So if you ever really wanna understand my work, look at my characters and forget their gender or forget their age. Just like think, what does she really believe? What does he really believe? And then you're gonna be able to know the entire arc of the story. So. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's probably the quickest way to see all the parallels of my characters and with all the classics that I'm so obsessed with. Um, all right, a couple more slightly overlapping questions. Um, Jacqueline asks, how relevant do you think the notion of the American dream as represented in Gatsby is today, particularly given some of the social shift away from capitalism and greed? And Elizabeth asks, um, says you mentioned that Fitzgerald was critical of social inequality, which feels very relevant for the time we're living in. And I'd love to hear more of your thoughts about that. Oh gosh, there's so much social inequality. But you know, I was thinking about what Jennifer was saying earlier that we live in a time of heightened class and race sensitivity. I think some of us are living in that world. Good point. I, I think many of us, unfortunately, really resent having to be heightened. <laughs> in our sensitivity and they fight it. They fight it really hard with their lives and they'll do anything to be at the center again. And I think that's a real tragedy because I think we'd have a stronger team if everybody was included. So rather than the pie is really small and I need to have every single slice, it's actually, we can have an enormous pie. It's, it's any, anytime you drive across America, you see how big it is how much space there is. And we actually have room for another 330 million people. <laughs> but rather than looking at it that way, it, it, it seems more like, no, we need to kind of, you know, raise the borders. So going back to inequality and um, the American dream, 
I'm really concerned. It's my big, one of my big issues in life is student loans. I'm very worried about student loan debt for young people. The cost of education is just untenable. It's killing middle-class parents and, and young people. I, I think when you're 18 or 19 years old, you shouldn't be allowed to sign up for a loan for six figures. You have no idea what that means. <laughs> It seems almost like malpractice to let young people sign those things. So that's um, so if we really care about class movement and transition, we need to think about the cost of education and also health care. Those are my two things where I feel like we got to fix this. We got to fix this. Um, and Daniel is asking along those lines, could you tell us a little more about Fitzgerald's personal relationship with money um, and or thoughts on capitalism? Well, um, it, you'll see this in, in, in the introduction. He kept a journal of how much money he made, like every single cent as a writer, which is really quite, I, I can imagine him having the, a kind of like the equivalent of an Excel spreadsheet. And I wish I was more careful too about how much I earn because a lot of times like I'll forget to invoice for $50 or whatever. But um, at the end of his life of his, I think 17 years of publication, he made what's equivalent. So over like $350,000, which is in today's dollars, about $6 million, which is a very healthy income for a fiction writer and an essayist. And he died almost penniless. Like he couldn't pay his kids college tuition. So he had to have his agent and friends constantly spot him loans. And back then college education did not cost what it costs right now. But he did have hospital bills for his wife and he was not a good saver. He was not a good saver. <laughs> All right, I think we can, we've got a couple more that I'm hoping we can get to. Um, this one is actually for Jennifer from Elizabeth. She says, your suggestions for further exploration are amazing. How did you approach it given how iconic this book is and what do you hope students take away from it? Well, that's kind of like me wondering for men and I should have just led with this question. How did you grapple with saying something new, right? How does one say something new with a book that is as iconic as this. So I guess I approached that project by just thinking, what are the layers of the book? So there's like the history layer. I really wanted to highlight the race and class layers of the book and give people ways to unpack that. I knew that the American dream was the iconic motif of the book. So how to go about conversations that are more complicated and nuanced about the American dream. And so as, as I had those layers in mind or like buckets or categories, I thought to myself, what are all the things that I've come across like in my own bookshelves or in my life as a consumer of podcasts, um, in my reading of memoir and nonfiction as well as literature. Um, I was just trying to think as capaciously as possible about sources that would give readers kind of like your intro man. It's why I've um, new, it's why I flagged this so many times, lots of ways in to what the book has to offer and ways of thinking about the book. So the multimedia approach was really important as well as just trying to kind of cast across the layers and themes of the book that seemed most significant to me. So, and I hope that it does just open more doors for people to think about what does Gatsby have to say in relation to a Freakonomics radio podcast or vice versa? Um, what is the Seeing White podcast sort of inflect into the story of Gatsby. So those were some things. Oh, that's I think great. that's really and, smart what you did. Yeah, it's really, really smart. And that's actually a great segue to this question, which, I, which might be our last. Um, Austin says, thanks to both of you and asks, I'm wondering what texts, American or otherwise, you would pair next to Gatsby in a curriculum in order to further emphasize its concerns about race, queerness, et cetera. What other texts would you teach alongside maybe Nella Larson's passing? And what, what others, what would you have in mind? Oh, golly. I want to talk about, like, I guess like, Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye is a really good example of aspiration. It doesn't have the parties, but it's really, a <laughs> it is a story that has an aspirational quality to it. And the tragedy is that it's impossible to be white. And I think uh, that's one book that I, Nella Larson's Passing is wonderful. I also think this is another old book is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn 
by Betty Smith. But again, it's a really big book. I don't know how much space you have in your mm -hmm. syllabus. Jennifer, can you but take that's, a But that goes back to what you said, Min. You can give short clips of things. You don't have to teach entire books. A book I read this summer that I'd heard of but hadn't read before but thought it might work for this project, The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace. Do you know this book, Min? Yes, I do. A brilliant do. young man who left mm -hmm. New York for the Ivy League. He went to Yale like we did. So I, so like a little snippet of that book as an aspiration story alongside Nick Carraway's and Gatsby's aspirations. You mentioned The Bluest Eye. How about Playing in the Dark by Toni Morrison? Yes. I mean, maybe just one essay out of that, but that's literary criticism about the role of blackness in the white imagination. Um, those two jump out. Oh, and then I would suggest Citizen by Claudia Rankin. Mm -hmm. Being an American and navigating the American space as a person who's minoritized and excluded and microaggressed all the time. So just any books that can bring out the nuance that's in Gatsby that might otherwise go overlooked, I think are good. I'm not sure this is non, because I think it's been controversial about Truman Capote, but In Cold Blood is so fascinating to read as a murder mystery in light of Gatsby. And I know that's like a really strange thing to say, but to really consider what that death means. I think that this is a part that really bothers me about The Great Gatsby and how it's a thought of is what the lives of George and Myrtle are. So these are my people from Queens. I want <laughs> folks to really sort of spend time on George and Myrtle and what their lives mean, what it means that they have to die, that what it means that Gatsby has to, we, we often think about Jay Gatsby's death. We don't think enough, I think, about Myrtle and George's death and what Myrtle wanted from having, to, from being with a person like Tom Buchanan. There's, well, there's so much that we could talk about still, but we're at the end of our hour. Thank you guys so oh, wait, much. Wait, wait, I have conversation. one question. I have a question for you, Jessica. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they asked me of all the bookstores and we should have this event. And I said, well, obviously Greenlight. <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask you as the owner of Greenlight, what, you know, what made you name your books for Greenlight? The green light at the end of the dock. I mean, there there are a number of associations with the green light. We're in the neighborhood of Fort Greene, but um, but we liked the green light as you know a safe space, you know, as and also as something aspirational. And I think we one at one point we had T-shirts that had so we beat on boats against the current, born back ceaselessly into the past, because sometimes that's what it feels like <laughs> to do the work that we're doing. But also, you know, because it's it's a text that we return to over and over again, and it's about sort of. You know, what you imagine, but also about a space where you can be safe. And th those were those were aspects that we wanted to identify with the store. Terrific, thank you. <laughs> you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> but thank you for asking. I mean, obviously the Great Gatsby is really key and, and, and dear to us as a store. And it was wonderful to hear both of you talk about it. So thank you so much. The link to buy this special new edition is in the chat. Um, so I hope that you will check it out and read Min's wonderful introduction. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Thank Min. you, Jennifer. You're the greatest. Thank you both. What a treat. Bye-bye. Okay, Good night.